<laughs> All right, we'll snap to that. We'll snap to that because that is true. That is definitely a takeaway, certainly a takeaway. All right, so without further ado, let's say a word of prayer and let's get in because y'all know our teacup is full tonight and we need to drink all this tea before we go to our beds, okay? <laughs> so let's pray. Let me admit these beautiful ladies coming in. All right, and let's say a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to hang out together, Lord. Um, <sighs> what a week, Lord, what a week. You know, um, you, you see what everybody here has gone through. And we just want to come thanking you, Lord, for bringing all of them through it. We thank you for all the blessings. We thank you for all the open doors and all the closed doors, for the protection, for all the comfort, for all of the, you know, just help that you have given to us this week and the strength, oh Lord. And Father, even at this time, as we get ready to talk about broken vessels, part two, we ask, Father, for your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us not to be afraid to, to talk about this, oh Lord. You know, guide each and every single one of us. You know, give us answers to life's hardest questions tonight, Father, if, if this is indeed, you know, where you are leading. So I put each and every single woman here before you tonight. And we ask, oh Lord, just for complete healing and happiness and joy in each and every single one of their lives. And be with Dr. Archer. We ask for your Holy Spirit to hover over her, fill her up. Sometimes, oh Lord, it, it might be difficult, you know, for her to find the answers to some of these questions. But Father, you have all the answers that you will speak through your daughter. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right. And just really quickly, if you have a friend, a female friend that has never been to tea time and you would like her to come and be blessed tonight, feel free to go to invite, copy and paste this link and send it to your girlfriend. This is open to everyone, whether you're Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, this is open for every single person. And um, the only people that it's not open to are men. Okay, so go ahead and share this with your friends. And without further ado, we would like to put Dr. Archer on the spotlight tonight, looking beautiful in her top bun, amen. And <laughs> let me go ahead and reintroduce Dr. Archer for you beautiful ladies. Now, Dr. Archer, I have to really, and I don't wanna miss anything. I definitely don't wanna miss anything. Okay, so. Dr. Archer is a clinical psychologist, ladies and ladies, no gentlemen. And she's been working with a number of clinical settings, including uh, detention centers, prisons, university counseling centers, private practice. Uh, in addition to her clinical work, she, uh, she's also a professor of psychology and certified strategic life coaching practic practitioner. So she's a certified strategic life coaching practitioner. And uh, for the past two years and a half, she has been serving as the head dean uh, of girls and school counselor. And um, while her husband, Pastor Oliver Archer, has been serving as the campus chaplain and Bible teacher at Maxwell uh, uh, Adventist Academy in Nairobi, Kenya. So they literally just came from Kenya just a little while ago. And, uh, and there they serve alongside their three children, ages 10, seven and three beautiful spread out in ages right there. And they all obeyed the call to become missionaries, okay? So Dr. Archer, she strongly believes in the exhortation of 1 Thessalonians 5.11 to encourage one another and build each other up and has used this as her life's work, as the guide for her life's work. So that falls smack in there just in the middle of tea, encouragement. So this evening we have Dr. Archer here to encourage us again with Broken Vessels, the sequel, part two. Dr. Archer, the time is yours. Thank you so much. And good evening, ladies. What a blessing it is for me to be able to be with you all again this evening. I wanna thank you, Sister Sarah, uh, for just graciously extending the invitation for a part two to what we began last Friday evening. So I am grateful for yet another opportunity, not just for me uh, to be able to share with all of you, but for us to share with each other, for us to dialogue, discuss, grow, and get free, right? But of course, before we begin, um, I would ask that you just bear with me um, so I can pray one more time and um, ask the Holy Spirit to hide me behind the cross so that Christ will be magnified. 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to come before your throne of grace one more time. Lord, we're coming not because um, we are worthy, but because we, we have nowhere else to turn. We're broken vessels, but we know that you can heal our hearts. You can mend those broken places. And so we come to you. We come to you because we really don't have the answers. We don't really know where to go. Um, and so we lay it all, we lay ourselves all at your feet and uh, we leave ourselves there knowing that if we just get an audience with you, if you can just touch us, then that will be the healing touch that we need. But in our journey to healing, in our journey to wholeness, we know that you can still use us, Lord. And so we are available. We're broken, but we are available vessels to be used in any way that you see fit. In Christ's name, amen. So the last time we were together, we talked about how incredibly difficult it is being a woman in today's world in light of the many different hats that we wear, as well as the judgment that we are sometimes subjected to, not to mention the burden we place on ourselves by trying to pretend like everything is fine and we have it all together, when the truth is things are falling apart. We talked about the reality of sin and the inevitability of pain and loss. I shared how our backgrounds and our upbringings, they help to shape our characters and the different struggles that we face and how in turn that can cause deep scarring in our hearts. And I talked about how as Christians, we sometimes have a hard time just reconciling the whys, right? The whys of our painful experiences, not fully understanding why God would allow them to happen. But then we discovered that not only is God standing next to us in our brokenness, come on somebody, not only can he heal our hearts, but he can use the tragedies of our lives for good, that he will use them for our good. As we are reminded in Romans 8, 28, where it doesn't say that all things would be good or feel good, but where it says that if we are his, all things would work together for our good and for his glory. And we, we learned that God does use broken people. In fact, he chooses on purpose broken people, which we see all throughout the Bible, like Peter, that foul mouthed fisherman, like David, an adulterer and murderer, like Moses, who had a speech impediment and a bit of an anger problem, like Rahab, who was a pro at propositioning men, like Saul, a persecutor of believers, like Matthew, a distrusted tax collector, and like you, and like me. And so, he chooses broken people like us, we learned, for at least three different reasons. He chooses people like you and like me because one, we are relatable. He chooses us because two, our messed up situation makes us see our need, right? Our need for a savior. And it allows others to witness our experience and know that it had to be God <laughs> working through us thus giving him the glory. And he chooses us because three, he wants to show us and the world that he can equip and qualify anyone to do his work. All he requires is an available vessel to be used. I also shared with you that one thing that broken individuals tend to feel the most is this sense of being unwanted, being unloved, uncared for, just not good enough. And the brokenness in our hearts can oftentimes blind us from the truth of God's love. But as you can imagine, in the same way that pain can blind us from God's love, it can also blind us and make us resistant to love from others or from loving others, keeping us in a destructive cycle of trying to find what, what we think, what we believe love should be. And that's because your heart, my heart, it's the essence of who we are. It encompasses everything we feel and think. It's that part of us that can be crushed by pain. And when we are hurt, especially repeatedly, when we're repeatedly hurt, it impacts the way we respond to life. 
So in addition to our hearts governing our speech, what we choose to look at, where we choose to go, it impacts our relationships, which is what we are focusing on this evening, because that's kind of where our discussion seemed to naturally migrate to last Friday evening. And so I want to honor that and talk about relationships, especially in the context of our heart, because our hearts are central. It's central to this whole thing. And so because of the importance of your heart, you need to guard it. And yet guarding your heart in relationships is a matter of being balanced, right? So you wanna protect your heart, but not close it off or cut yourself off completely from people. And so how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So let's break it down. Okay, so the verse begins by saying above all, all else. Now, all 30,000 verses of the Bible are from God. So when you see the words above all else in scriptures, that's a highlighter. It's an alert, alert signal, meaning pay attention. This is a priority. This right here is extremely important. And then it says, guard your heart. So your heart is the core of who you are, your insides, literally the inner person. It refers to all of the contents that reside in your brain. That includes your values, your thoughts, your opinions, your feelings, your decisions. So if you've ever experienced losing heart at a time when you became discouraged or demotivated, it's probably because you either allowed someone to take your time or energy or because you allowed someone inside your heart who had no business being there, right? And the result was that there was hurt and damage and, and and let me just let me just pause here for a little commercial break okay because a lot of women complain and get mad at people for sucking the life out of them but watch this you can't keep getting mad at people for sucking the life out of you if you keep giving them the straw hello and so to guard literally means to protect in other words watch over yourself watch over your inner self keep it from harm that is the role of a boundary. You know, whether it be the word no, whether it be a difficult conversation or confrontation or some limit you need to set up in a relationship, do what needs to be done. You know, so often people think that saying no, and, and first of all, no can be a complete sentence all by itself if you need it to be, okay? You know, but often people think that saying no and, and taking responsibility to guard yourself is being selfish or rude, but we have been entrusted with the task of guarding our hearts. But so often, especially in dating or romantic relationships, we don't guard our hearts. We give away much too much of our heart and, and we give away other stuff too, but we might, we'll get to that later. But we give away too much of our heart to someone we don't know well right? We don't know them that well. And we don't have many safeguards in place to keep our hearts from being hurt. And your heart is an important part of you. And it's too valuable to get destroyed by relationships that aren't right. So here are a few safeguards to put in place in your relationships. So, so just as an extension of guarding your heart, it's important that you also guard your words. So pay attention to what you say. Don't promise too much or say things that you aren't going to carry through on. You know, you can actually hurt your heart and the heart of others by the words you speak. So choose to speak words of life to yourself and to others. The word, the word in Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. And so you would also do well to guard your imagination. It's easy, this, this is, we, women are, we're famous for this. It's easy to get carried away in a dating relationship, right? You might go on three dates and think you found the one, right? In your imagination, you've named your first three kids. You've decided what your house is going to look like, just doing the most. But this isn't healthy, right? You can set yourself up for heartbreak if you don't guard what you allow yourself to dwell on and then, of course, you have to guard 
who you date. Hello, somebody. Don't just date anyone. Make sure their values line up with yours. Make sure they feel like you do about important issues. Don't just date someone because they like you. Make sure you have common ground. And, and I don't know, uh, Sister Sarah, maybe there's going to need to be a part three mm. on what Christian dating should look like, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of women around here looking real crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? L let me just do another little commercial break right here because um, it, it seems like there are many Christian singles just really struggling to figure out just how to handle this whole dating thing. Mm -hmm. So, so, but first of all, what is dating? I mean, in a very general sense, I guess we could say it's the process by which unmarried persons hopefully, because hopefully we're not married out here running around trying to date people, unless you're talking about dating your husband and then that's cute. But okay, so the process by which unmarried persons of the opposite sex get to know each other, right? But this definition has evolved quite a bit over the years and modern dating seems to have replaced the courting process that was standard back in the day. And actually many Christians believe that Christians should be courting and not dating, right? And then others don't really see anything wrong with modern dating as long as there are constraints. But again, so, so, so what is dating? What is courting? So if we were to just look at Wikipedia's definition, right? Dating is described as a ritual consisting of social activities done by two persons with the aim of assessing the other's suitability as a partner in an intimate relationship or as a spouse. And so when I think about this definition, two things stick out to me. Number one, it's a social encounter. And then number two, it can possibly evolve into an intimate relationship, right? So then what is courting? What's, what's courtship, courting, and all that stuff? So then again, if we go to Wikipedia, it describes courting as a ritual that precedes a couple's engagement in marriage or establishment of an agreed relationship of a more enduring kind. In courtship, a couple gets to know each other and decides if there will be an engagement or other such agreement. And so when I look at this definition, the two things that stick out to me are number one, it's a mutual agreement. And number two, it's very purposeful. Listen, in my opinion, you know, I'm gonna just say Christian courting is only for Christians mature enough to get married. Hello. Uh, you know, when you court, you are saying you are ready for marriage. Not only are you ready for marriage in general, but you're also saying that you believe you would like to be married to the person you are courting and will go through sort of this intense season to see if marriage should occur. And so Christian courting tends to emphasize like a, a pre-courting phase that values friendship and group activities before any type of romantic interest is expressed. So guarding your heart, because we're still talking about guarding your heart. Guarding your heart is heavily emphasized in that, you know, it would be wise to observe the individual closely and build a relationship with this person in the safety of a Christian community and, and, and in as many settings as possible. For example, in group settings, around his friends, and especially around his family, because guess what? How he treats the women in his life, like his sisters, like his mother, that's a sneak preview of how he's going to treat you. Now, of course, I think it's also important for you to get to know him in the context of, you know, just the two of you, because spending intentional one-on-one -on -one time together allows both of you to experience what it would be like to continue in the relationship. But here's, here's the tricky thing about that one-on-one -on -one stuff. See, unmarried people are, at, are out here engaging in kissing, foreplay, and even sex. And see, the enemy has done a great job at infiltrating the courting process. Now, let me just be real, right? I'm not going to proscribe to you. I'm not going to proscribe to a bunch of grown women what you should and shouldn't be doing inside of your adult relationships. <laughs> However, I do think that most, if not all of you would agree that sex outside of marriage is not God's ideal. It's not God's will, right? So guard your purity. Don't give that away. You know, when I used to, give relationship sem seminars at um, Oakwood and with other um, young people groups, I would get a lot of pushback. Like, well, what's wrong with having sex inside of marriage? Um, what's the big deal? Um, 
you know, I want to test, I want to test the waters first. I want to make sure that I'm gonna like how he is before I get married and da da da. So what I would try to do is kind of help them visualize and get like a mental picture to make it stick and make them understand. So, so I'm gonna share it here. So if you would imagine two pieces of paper uh, that you want to glue together, right? And so you glue them together, you use glue, you glue it together. And then two weeks later, two months later, maybe even a year later, you decide, hmm, I, you know what? I, I don't want these two pieces of paper to be glued together anymore. Just kidding, I, I don't want. So then you, you try to find a piece of the, you know, the edge and you try to rip it apart because cause, cause you, you, you don't want that adhesive. You, you wanna take it apart. Mm -hmm. um, guess what? That's not gonna be a clean break. Hello, somebody. That's going to be a messy process, right? If you try to rip those pieces of paper apart, guess what? They're both going to be damaged. But you know what's interesting? Because I've actually done this before. And maybe you've done this before as well. But you know what I noticed when I try to rip two pieces of paper apart that have been glued together um, for some time? That there's usually one piece of paper that's more damaged than the other. Hello, somebody. And who do you think you are in this scenario? Uh huh. That's right. It's you. So the bottom line is there's no winners there. When we adhere ourselves to people that we have no business doing it, doing that with, there's damage. There's damage. So wait until you're married. Now. Praise God, there's restoration, there's healing. Uh, you know, some of you may have already engaged in, uh, in premarital sex or uh, what have you. And, and that's between you and, and Christ. But we're talking about moving forward. We're talking about God's ideal. We're talking about doing better because we know better. We're talking about moving forward. We're talking about getting healed and restored. And so we want to, we want to preserve that. We want to wait. We want God's ideal. We want God's best. We want God's best. And so here's the deal. Giving up your purity is an excellent way for you to experience heartbreak. And we are talking about guarding our hearts, right? And so it just seems to me like modern dating as opposed to courting has become more of a sport or a hobby and less of a purposeful activity. But but to be fair, you know, I think that there's, I think there's a lot of, challenge in this area because the words date and court, courtship, courting, they're not found in the scriptures, right? God doesn't give us specific laws and commands about the process of getting married. Rather, the Bible gives us commands about marriage. So what is the best approach for Christian singles? Again, I don't believe the Bible gives us a dating formula. Rather, I believe that the Bible gives us relationship principles that should be applied. I believe that Christian singles who wanna date God's way, I think we should be less concerned with the what, like in terms of what it's called, dating, courtship, but less concerned with what it's called and more concerned with the how and the why. Cause I mean, you can take different approaches and do it for the wrong reasons. Like you can go on a blind date for the glory of God while guarding your heart and doing all the appropriate things, right? Or you can date somebody you've gotten to know in a Christian group. <laughs> Lord knows I've done that. You can date someone you've gotten to know in a Christian group setting and, and do all manner of foolishness with them, right? <laughs> so, you know, I think in terms of how we should move forward, it might be helpful to focus more on how you approach the search for a spouse and why you are searching for a spouse. But, you know, I actually, I just triggered myself because I used the word search um, and I feel another commercial break coming on. Because I'm reminded of a verse in the Bible that says, he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. That's Proverbs 18, 22. So I had just triggered myself by saying search. So I'm using the word search kind of loosely, like just the process. See, because, and some of you may disagree with me on this and that's okay because it'll just make for a healthy dialogue in the question and answering section. But, you know, just thinking about this whole searching thing, I, I don't believe that you have to strategically place yourself anywhere or go out of your way to try to get noticed by a man. I just don't believe you have to do that. See, the first step in dating or courtship or whatever you want to call it, I believe, should be the step of faith <laughs> that we take toward our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let him capture your heart. 
where you will find your deepest joy. Hide your soul in him and stop trying to control things or force things when it comes to relationships. We ought to devote our minds to knowing him more and more and plead with him to conform our mind and will to his. We need to put all of our strength into figuring out his goal and plan for our life. Listen, if our heart is not there, if our mind is distracted and focused on other lesser things, if our best strength is being spent on anything other than God, even on good things. Because look, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be in a relationship. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be married. In fact, the word in Genesis 2.18 says that it is not good for the man to be alone. Come on, somebody. I will make a helper suitable for him. So there's nothing wrong with any of that. But if our hearts right, are not fully devoted to God, we won't even be in a position to be in a healthy relationship in the first place. So do you want to date and marry well? Then listen to Jesus and love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Put Matthew 6, on it and seek him first. Come on, somebody. And dating and court, courting and all of that will be added according to his perfect plan and timing. We, we've got to start with what we think and what we feel about God. Do we love him more than anything else? Will we obey him even when it will cost us? Are we willing to set aside anything for his sake, including a relationship? Because we're real quick. Oh, Lord, I'll, I'll tithe. I'll give you my money. Uh, you, you can have this job, Jesus. But, but when it comes to our relationship, <laughs> we get real funny about the relationship. So are we willing to set anything aside for his sake, including a relationship? Will we trust him? even when we might want something else for ourselves. The reality is this, you will not truly love anyone else if you do not love God first and most. So I, I wanna close by looking at three simple words that I believe can help us remember how to guard our hearts, especially as we navigate our brokenness. Trust, detach, protect. Trust, detach, and protect. So trust. So when someone repeatedly mistreats you, lies to you, or lets you down, you don't have to offer blind trust. In fact, you shouldn't trust again until and unless the person reestablishes a track record of being a trustworthy person that you can open your heart to. You can actually choose when to trust and what verification you need from them in order to trust them again. Detach. When someone is doing things to hurt you, you need to detach by not taking the words and actions personally. You do this by recognizing that the person has problems, probably from wounds and scars from their own brokenness. Because guess what? Hurt people hurt people. And so because of their brokenness, they're saying and doing things that are not true or don't accurately reflect who you are. Rather, they are reflective of what's going on with that person. So don't take what they say to heart. Let that go and pray for them and then protect protect yourself. You guard your heart by recognizing how the person hurts you. And then you've got to put up boundaries. You don't engage in conversations where you're being put down, yelled at, disrespected. You don't reveal information that can be used against you. You don't share truths about yourself that are precious with someone who doesn't value them. As much as possible, you simply don't put yourself in situations where you can be hurt. Now, of course, this is not a perfect science, right? And sometimes we, we misread the other person, maybe because of our own brokenness, we're not the best judge of character. But let's be real, some of us like to volunteer too much too soon, okay? So just pump the brakes a little bit on that. So guard your heart by reestablishing trust slowly, detaching from things that aren't true, and by protecting yourself with boundaries. If you if you don't guard your heart from people who are willing to hurt you, you may lose your heart. And remember, it's just the one heart that we have, right?
So make sure that you put up some safeguards. Don't give your heart away too easily to someone. Be sure that you've taken the time to get to know them and that you've, you've presented the relationship before the Lord seeking guidance from him. And the last part of Proverbs 4.23 says, for everything you do flows from it. Again, speaking about the heart, right? So again, why is your heart so important? Why does Proverbs 4.23 say, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it? Because your entire life's path depends on how healthy your heart is. All of your actions, how you treat yourself, how you engage in your relationships with God and others, and the impact you make on the world is directed by what happens in your heart, right? Think of it from the health perspective. If you take care of your body and eat right, exercise and sleep well, you're likely to have a healthy body for a long time. But, but by neglecting or abusing your body, well, that can result easily in sickness and dysfunction. And in the same way, your heart is critical to developing and maintaining healthy relationships and living life God's way. And so I just want to remind us that as we navigate our relationships in the midst of trying to get healing from our brokenness, we ought to look to the word for godly principles and stay on our knees in prayer, asking for God's will to be revealed to us. And as we look to him for our healing and focus on being obedient to him, let's trust him to prepare us and position us for the one that he has for us. Amen. Yes. Let's, let's yes. pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for being a God that is concerned about us. You're concerned about the things we're concerned about. Nothing catches you off guard. And Lord, so many of us are broken, but we're calling brokenness out. We're, we're, we're calling that thing out, Lord. And we're saying, Lord, use us anyhow. Lord, use us in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our healing process, use us. Give us, give us what we need, Lord. Fill us. We, we are, we're presenting ourselves to you as broken but available vessels. And the, and the cool thing about being a broken vessel is when the light of Christ is in us, people can see that light through the cracks. And so we're just excited for what you're going to do in our lives. I'm excited for what you're going to do in the lives of these women who have joined us this evening, Lord, as we seek healing, as we make ourselves available to you, as we uh, seek to know how we can navigate being in good and healthy relationships with those around us, Lord, we're excited for what you're going to do. And we will be careful that, that, that when you bring us through, when we are on the other side, but even before we get there, we're going to give you a yet praise because we are expecting a miracle to be wrought in our lives. And so we're excited for what you're going to do. And we will be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, Sister Archer. Excellent. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Hey. Yes. Um, I just, I just don't know where to begin in terms of, um, you know, sometimes I look for, uh, after a presentation, I look for a, that one take, uh, one point to take home, and I have several. Uh, but out of all of them, the main point Amen. that I would like to take home is right. Yeah, y'all could relate. <laughs> I heard it in that. Amen. <laughs> um, I I really like. Even as a married woman, I even like trust, detach, and uh, the last one was um. Protect, you know. Um, trust, detach, and protect. You know, it, it applies across the border. But of course, you know, with the majority here being single women and, um, you know, of the age of me, you know, getting into real relationships and such, I think that is so powerful. That is definitely so powerful. And, you know, Dr. Archer, she kept her talk brief tonight because she knows that you have questions. And last week, you know, y'all wanted to keep it longer, but, you know, because we can't really do that so much, we had a, we had a bigger, a longer Q&A for y'all tonight. So let us go ahead and begin that. I am going to uh, 
end the recording. But in the meantime, the format in which we take, we you know do the raise hand feature. Then you can go ahead and unmute yourself, turn your video on if you would like to. We would love to see your faces so we can interact, but no pressure. Um, yes. So who would like to ask the first question? Who would like to ask the first question? And if you did put something in the chat, uh, feel free to send it to me privately or um, Dr. Archer privately. Sarah Sikora, go ahead, my sis. First of all, thank you, Dr. Archer. Um, your message confirmed uh, a lot for me today. And uh, I, I'm in this process of trust, detach, and protect. My question is coming around the protect um, 